Hello, my name is Luke Lewich and I am an expert gameplay engineer from Wargaming Sydney and today I would like to talk about polish and prototyping. Now who am I? I have been an engineer for 20 years and while it took me a while to get gainful employment in the game industry, I've been making games in one for another, form or another for most of that time. I have a fairly eclectic range of experiences, I have a master's in robotics and I actually started off fixing life support systems here in New South Wales before I moved to the United States, where I focused exclusively on software. I started working in games at Microsoft and I spent the majority of my time at Bungie, where I worked on the Halo and Destiny series. I moved back to Australia four years ago and I've been at Wargaming Sydney ever since. So who is Wargaming Sydney? We are a game studio based in Sydney, and here is the latest photo I could find of a group larger than five, and it harkens from a day when gathering the studio was still allowed, so it's slightly out of date. The studio focuses on supporting the games developed within Wargaming Studios around the world, and this includes currently live games such as World of Tanks or World of Warships, as well as numerous game projects in various stages of development, from ideation into production. During my time at Wargaming Sydney, I've worked on several different teams and projects, and I've focused on de-risking new technology or working directly with game prototyping. I worked on the technical prototype for AR streaming, which we took to Gamescon in 2018, and I was the lead for a prototyping team that developed several internal game prototypes. Currently, I'm an engineering lead on a multidisciplinary team, which is working on building gameplay content for an unknown's title. Now, before I go too far in, I need to bring up a disclaimer. The content that goes into this talk I've, has been accumulated over the last four years from internal projects to wargaming, game jams, and directed, uh, personally directed learning, as well as a bunch of um, independent projects. Now, a lot of the content for these projects is still in production and has not been announced, which I mean to, means I've had to curate what is shown. In some cases, I will reproduce the issue in a small demo project to capture the material. So, what shall we talk about? Polish in prototyping is something that I've had to deal with a lot, and it's something I feel is often overlooked. Over the course of all the prototypes I've worked on, there's always an ideal to work quickly, which is prioritizing speed over quality. Now, this often stems from need, as budgets and timelines are tight. However, experience has taught me that investing in polishing the right aspects of a prototype can greatly improve its effectiveness. Now the purpose of this talk is to sell you on the idea that the quality that polishing brings has a lot of value and to impart you with knowledge and processes for identifying in a prototype what you should polish. I'll start by talking about what prototyping means to me as this forms the basis of evaluation for the techniques I present. Then I'll dive into a set of questions you can ask when you are prototyping to evaluate what you should polish. And then I'm going to double down on what I consider the most important aspect and talk about preparation for a prototype. Lastly, in the bulk of the talk, is a series of examples that highlight what I've polished in the past and the impacts it made on the prototype itself. So prototyping means a lot of different things to a lot of different people in a lot of different industries. It's very common as part of many design processes and you see a lot of paper prototypes for apps. It's also well established in uh, traditional engineering roles, such as mechanical and aeronautical, and that results in building a whole plane or a car as a prototype. For games, I went and looked for a definition that was more suitable for my needs and put a little bit of a twist on it. To me, prototyping is an experimental process that creates a tangible experience to test a hypothesis. Now, the important things to take away from this definition is Prototyping is experimental. It is investigating new work and it's trying things that have not been done before. It is iterative and it's explorative of a problem space. Prototyping also needs to be tangible. It doesn't need to be a paper prototype. It doesn't need to be a whole plane. But in games, it does need to be something that a player can actually get their hands on and interact with. Prototyping is also a test. It should be allowed to fail that test. It can be a successful prototype as long as it tests its hypothesis. Now this comes back to the experimental aspect of it, but if you're not willing to fail, I do not think you're exploring the problem face sufficiently. And lastly, prototypes need a hypothesis on that they should focus on so they have clarity about their testing about whether they achieved it. Now one point that has not been covered by this is why are prototypes useful? I think a strong motivation for prototyping in gaming is to remove and mitigate uncertainty and risk in, before you enter production. Now, while you can make a plan and have an idea and have a good amount of work put into the early stages of ideation, 
until you can get a tangible prototype into players' hands, I think you have a lot of risk and uncertainty. Now, as for polish, I think the definition from Merriam Webster was perfect for my purposes to bring to a highly developed, finished, or refined state. Now, prototypes are rarely going to be finished and they're rarely going to be in a refined state, but I think aspects of the prototype should be highly developed for you to prototype efficiently. Another thing to be noted that was not part of the definition is speed. Prototyping, however, prototyping does take time and budget, so and it is also scope is unbound because of the natural desire to want to explore. This means that generally people will be working quickly with their prototypes. The one thing that was usually sacrificed first in the name of speed and scope is quality. However, if you're sacrificing quality without evaluating the impacts it has on both speed and scope, I think you are prototyping inefficiently. So the next part of the talk talks about how do you identify what parts of a prototype should be of higher quality, and therefore you should focus your polishing efforts. The next, covers, the next session covers this by looking at questions you can ask to evaluate that. Now, why do you polish a prototype? A prototype is an investment of time and effort to remove uncertainty from a project. It's important that the prototype and the hypothesis it focuses on achieves this outcome of reducing uncertainty. Now, there are several motivations that you can focus your polishing efforts on. You can be enabling faster iteration, so you can explore the problem space more. You can be drawing attention to the hypothesis, so you're more confident in what's being tested. Or you could be removing direct distractions that inhibit the entire process and make the process more efficient. Now, to enable fast iteration, you need to identify the core systems of the prototype and build them with developer iteration in mind. Now, this becomes a force multiplier on how quickly your artisan designers and engineers can work and therefore how much of the problem space they can explore with confidence. Now, when working with designers, this will be building them game systems that can be quickly iterated, tweaked and tested. For artists, it may be uh, content pipelines that allow them to generate content quickly and efficiently, specifically for your prototype. And lastly, something that should not be forgotten is game prototypes need to be tested. And play testing can be a very time consuming part of your iteration loop. Infrastructure that will make play testing and building efficient will net gains and allow you to iterate faster and therefore explore more of the problem space. Now, prototypes in games do not exist in isolation. Just to test a simple ability, you're going to need a game object to place that ability on, possibly a game object to use that ability on, an entire game world for these two objects to exist, an input system to back it up, and some UI, and the list just keeps going on. Among all of this infrastructure and noise, it's just testing one ability. However, it's very easy for this one ability and this one focus of your prototype to fall to the wayside against everything else. So polishing anything about this one feature will draw the attention to what is important for the prototype. It's worth noting that polish in general that draws attention to other aspects of the prototype can be very detrimental. In this case, simply adding some polish to jumping into lava to show that it's not a bug and it was actually a feature actually had a lot of people jump into lava just to hear the sound effect and the noise. Now, to get high quality feedback from a player, you need to focus their attention on the hypothesis of the prototype and make sure they interact with it. Removing distractions is key for them to focus. So in this way, removing distractions means removing features that might draw their attention away from the prototype. It might be fixing bugs that makes it harder for them to interact with the hypothesis. It could go so far as building an entire custom level that gives the player space from greater game context to focus on what you're trying to test. One technique that's shown here is to set a prototype up to success, you can reduce the rest of the game down so that only the experimental feature remains prominent. You run a risk that you'll get some feedback that the, the world is too boring, but I think that outweighs the attention drawing aspects that allows you to focus your prototype on what's important. So when do, you polish prototype? when do you polish in a prototype? When in the prototype's production schedule should you actually put the effort in? Now there's no hard and fast rule here and it really depends on your motivating for adding, motivation for adding the polish. So it'll dictate when it's most appropriate to do it. 
When you are enabling iteration, the answer is always as soon as possible. This saves developers from wasting time using systems that aren't ready or just working inefficiently at the start of the project. For everything else, however, you don't need to draw attention to a feature until people are missing it. And you don't need to remove distractions until they exist. Now, in any given iteration loop, the focus and hypothesis that you're currently testing may need to have attention drawn to it and may have need to have distractions removed. But until you're actually at that stage, you will not know. So when you are drawing attention and removing distraction with polish, it should be done on an iteration level to support the current hypothesis you're testing. Now, what do you need to prove or test for that matter? This is probably the most important question you're asked and it comes directly back to your the objectives you prototype and your hypothesis. You need to know what you're trying to prove, what you're testing, and what uncertainty you're trying to remove. I found in pro when prototyping games, most hypothesis and iterations focus on three broad categories at a time. For technical features, it's very easy to define what needs to be proved. And in my experience though, it's always worth asking the question if you can undress the uncertainty for less. And I usually look at this on three angles. How feasible is it? Is it performant and at what scale? And is it flexible enough to meet the needs. An important point to note when you're evaluating technical systems is how confident are you in the original parameters? When they said they needed 100 units on screen to test it, did they need 100 or did they actually want 1,000? In this case, you need to make sure that your technical feature is actually going to deliver what the prototype needs. Now, when looking at gameplay features, simple mechanics or loops, it's usually easy to find, again, what to prove but it's often hard to create a meaningful hypothesis. For gameplay features, I find it important to focus on the player and the response that you wish to invoke in them with this feature. You may wish to promote pressure and, and time pressure or relaxation, or more often than not, you just want the player to have fun and engagement with that feature and, make them, and have them want to do it over and over again. A game player experience is very similar to a gameplay feature. However, it mainly differs in scope and in the concept that it really can't be tested in isolation. Examples include art styles, or atmospheric gameplay, or meta loops. Now, the big question to ask when prototyping a player experience is what is core to the experience and what is actually needed? Because while many systems will be needed for the player to receive the response you want from them, not everything will be needed. In some cases, you can remove the action elements and focus on the atmosphere. Or in the case of a meta loop, you may just remove the game part altogether and just allow players to win or lose on a mouse click. That'll allow you to focus purely on the loop and the time that it, as a player moves through your meta. Now, once you've identified what's essential to your prototype, the next question to ask is who is the audience? Because this is who you're proving it to. This is equally important as players have different needs in reducing uncertainty. The final audience for your game is not necessarily the same audience for your prototype. They do need to be the foremost of you in mind because you will be making a game for them and, the, and hence the prototype is for them on some level, but they're not necessarily the source of uncertainty right now. And they're not necessarily what the objective of the prototype is trying to achieve. So if it is not the final player who you are building this for, who is it? Yourself and the team is a prime candidate, in which case you want something more tangible to prove your concepts. And or you want alignment with the team on the current direction you are taking. However, in this case, the team is very close to you. They will be interacting with the pro prototype quite a lot. And the amount of polish needed to support them and get, get their alignment is not so much. If you expand it to the studio, these are people who may not be work, working on the prototype every day. They may have knowledge of it. You will interact with them directly and be able to gather feedback directly from them but they will need a little more context to play your game. And that context needs to be, either needs to be delivered in person or through polish of your prototype. Now, if you take it one step further away and you talk about external people to your studio, you need to understand what their needs are. And in many cases, this is external stakeholders like publishers or UX test players. What do you know about them? What support do they need to understand what your prototype is trying to achieve? And how can you get feedback from them to assess uncertainty that you might have or might they might have in the case of stakeholders? 
generally speaking, as the, as the more number of players increases who will play your prototype and the further away they are from the vision holder, the more polish can help you to meet the needs of these remote players. So prototyping is an exercise on embarking on something larger and it's preparation for that. It is not the time to skip preparation. In many ways, I consider this the first piece of polish and it's also the most effective. While you can jump in in a prototype and get something running in sort of a few hours to sort of play it quickly, in my experience, it's worth stepping back and putting some effort into pre preparing for the prototype and bringing polish to the process of prototyping itself. Aligning on the hypothesis is essential in my mind. Getting the stakeholders, the team and the individuals aligned on what you need to prove and who you need to prove it on makes sure that you're testing the right thing. Now, a common trend in prototyping is to try and search for general concepts. You're trying to find the fun, bottle the lightning, create some magic. Whatever it is, it is very vague. And it does try to capture the ethereal nature of games in many ways, and that it is very hard to define what we find fun. But I do not think it is productive in a prototype to be searching for that. I think it is better to have a hypothesis that you can test in the short term, and that hypothesis can shift, and but it will allow you to focus on the test and allow you to focus on identifying what makes your game fun. Because then you, if you identify it, you won't be able to lose it if you iterate further. Now assume that you've aligned on your hypothesis, you need to start talking about your tech for the prototype. The prototype engine does not need to be the same thing you build your final game with. You have different needs in the prototyping phase than you do in the final game. Now, proprietary engines, they come with a lot of benefits. They were a specialized development environment that was very good at delivering one kind of game because it's shipped and it is probably successful. They do come with the concept that it may be less cost effective to modify the engine than it would be to build from scratch. And that is what you need to evaluate when talking about proprietary tech. Unity and Unreal are the next two big players in third party engines. They are very flexible and they have a lot of strengths and weaknesses particular to themselves. The benefit of them being most popular is you will often have skills in them and they have a large set of support network backing them up. There are also a vast array of other third party engines that may suit the needs of your project and prototyping. But the core thing is, do these engines support your team to prototype? Do you have the necessary experience to work in them quickly and efficiently? Because that is one of the goals of your prototype, is to work quickly to remove uncertainty. And reducing uncertainty, I think, is actually the key part of evaluating an engine. Prototyping is not an ideal time to learn a new skill. If you are learning a skill, your attention is now split between learning the skill and working on the prototype. And proficiency in any given engine or tool or software that supports your prototype effort is key because it allows your developers to focus on the experiment and not the methods they're using. Give it the added bonus that it also means anything they do will be done better and faster because they have confidence, proficiency, and expertise in the tools they're working with. Now, once you have your engine, the next part that can rapidly add polish to a prototype is to use existing content and to build on the work of others. Now, an existing game is a great source of assets as well as functional gameplay systems. Even if you're not using the direct engine, you can benefit from importing the models into your prototype. Um, however, there is a constraint here that I talked about before. It does need to match what your prototype is trying to achieve. There's also some less obvious uh, drawbacks that you need to consider. Among high quality assets and systems, any new feature you add either has to be brought up to scratch or run the risk of being seen as a distraction or drawing attention away from what you're able to test. And that will cost you more time to raise the polish bar or to address these distractions. The other consideration, which is a little bit subtle, is any existing content and gameplay assets definitely comes with expectations. If your target audience is familiar with the content, it can have a negative impact on you successfully getting them to engage with a new concept. When we have used World of Tanks assets in the past and we've changed their speed of capabilities of a unit, we often got feedback that was tightly tied to the original game. In this case, the tank is too fast. Regardless of the relative speed of the tank in the prototype, 
people are identifying this tank with what they expect, and it, since it behaves differently, it is now a distraction. The same is also true of gameplay features. I shot the tank in the track and I expected it to be stopped. This is a core feature of World of Tanks. It does not necessarily need to exist in the new prototype, but because the game feels and looks just like what they expect, that expectation has come along. Conversely, in another prototype, we tried to break this association by taking a very generic looking vehicle. However, in this particular case, we went a bit too far. The, we got a lot of feedback focus on the visuals of the unit and not how it played. And basically was our audience really expected the tanks to be these heavy vehicles in destruction. And they felt that this, this hover tank did not meet that. So we missed our mark. Coming, knowing your audience, knowing what they expect and choosing gameplay and content that will fall into the background of the core experience is definitely something you should think about in your preparation phase. Another source of assets to help you polish are uh, storeboard. There are a wealth of assets of all levels of quality. Um, however, there are a few drawbacks to them. One is that they are of different quality and style, so it may be hard to create an entire set that has a cohesive feel. They may also take a little time to use effectively, and of course they do cost something. Um, you may be able to build up a library of free assets for the purpose of prototyping, but you do need to consider some of the licensing constraints around free assets, and you also need to consider the fact that it takes time to build up that library. Another source of assets you can use would be your previous prototypes. In this case, we know that they're at a good level of polish, and you can pull them straight across and choose the pieces that you want. In this case, we took the can and converted them in the ball for a prototype. This gave us nice polished networking and movement, character animations were free, even though we totally changed the top of it and gave it a very large grey box for a gun because I didn't need to polish that. Now, practical examples. In these practical examples I'm focusing on things that I have built in the past and I'm not going to go into too much details because the details are very specific to the example and not necessarily the lessons that you should take away from it. So the first set of group no, practical examples I'm going to focus on are technical ones because they're very easy to talk about. So let's start with a small feature that was barely a prototype, but it does highlight several of the principles in Microsoft. On one of the projects, we were using a new piece of technology with Unreal for our game. And a request came from Art to support multiple UV channels for rendering. Now this was not supported by the feature as it was still in beta. And Art needed us to be certain we could support multiple UV channels before they started building content. Now in hindsight, we, knew, we found out that building the complete system would have ended up taking several developers a couple of sprints to get a finished asset into the engine. And while diving in instantly, we probably could have come to the same conclusion eventually. However, preparing for this technical prototype and focusing on the minimum functionality we needed to remove the uncertainty paid off. What we found was we investigated the underlying tech of this new piece of technology, and we found it used the same vertex format and render calls as procedural mess system, which is readily available in, from all aspects of Unreal. So we used a procedural mesh entry point, we showed that our content could be easily piped through, and a second UV channel exposed. And this way we removed the uncertainty without investing too much time. This was the right amount of polish spent preparing, to gain a good amount of effectiveness out of it. Now, technical polish is not always so cheap and easy. In some cases, technical polish is a large endeavor and is required as part of more ambitious projects to prove feasibility, and is usually required to raise the performance of these more ambitious prototypes, otherwise you risk a large distraction. It's also possible to approach any polish you do technically as a prototype unto itself which itself can benefit from polish. Now, in one prototype, the server would start to lose performance once the unit count got to a few hundred. This was really concerning as we were, we were aiming to have 500 units be in a game at once. The performance impact was going to get quite bad and it was really hard for players to enjoy the experience once we got closer to our target number of actual units. So we investigated where the performance bottleneck was. The server was CPU bound, but it turned out for not for a traditional reason. The CPU cost to replicate hundreds of units was too much, just purely due to the comparison and maintenance of all those networked fields. We did a polish pass, we tried to reduce the complexity and the bandwidth, 
but at the end of the day, it was not sufficient for us to get the order of magnitude of performance we needed. So the decision was made to try to prototype something new. Now, within the structure of the prototype was a potential solution. The majority of the units in this game were grouped together in logical squads. And a hypothesis was simple. If only the squads are replicated, will the players still enjoy the gameplay? So the individuals were removed from the networking model, their behavior was made de mostly deterministic on the client, and the squad became the only, only network channel, which since everything was now deterministic, could be much simpler. Now in this case, performance was completely lifted, and we got up to a thousand, u thousand, unit, count, thousand unit count comfortably. We even tested at the full extremes of the system and was getting up to about 1700 uh, units. Now, while the server was chugging, it did not crash, which meant that this, with enough polish, the system could probably scale to much higher than what we already had. The next set of examples focuses on expectations. Modern games have been refined for decades to create a smooth player experience. And while your prototype may be forgiven for not necessarily reaching this high level of fidelity, it's really important to identify the feature set that your prototype needs. Because if you do not have these features that players expect, at best it will be a minor distraction to them, and at worst it will make them impossible to engage with your prototype in the way you intend. So the first example I have in expectations is an example of a lesson learned. At Wargaming Sydney, we have a program of personally directed work to foster innovation. One of these is called one of these programs is called HackOps, where you form a small team and you build whatever you want over a few days. In a recent HackOps, I neglected to see the importance of building a precision aiming mode. I'd been playing and playtesting the prototype consistently over a few days and had given me the necessary skill to not see the importance to add uh, aim down sights or sniper mode. However, for new players who were playing it for the first time, it became instantly apparent that they could not even hit half the objectives. This did not actually allow them to engage with the prototype, and in most cases, they could barely get past the first phase. So the lesson to be learned from this is do not underestimate the need for core features of a genre, or more importantly, how hard it is to play a game fresh, especially one that is rough as a prototype built in a few days. Now, the second half of the problem that I have solved before with this is that in most third-party game engines, the mouse and camera movements are, are linearly linked, which means there is often a minimum distance you can move the camera based on the minimum distance you can move the mouse based on your hardware. Now, this gives you a consistent feel because it allows the player to spin around at a smooth movement as they put their mouse in. Smaller movements result in larger, smaller actions. However, if you aim in at a long distance to a small target through cluttered terrain, it can be impossible to make the shot because the minimum distance you can move your cursor is greater than a pixel. Now to get around this problem, it's actually quite simple. You can polish your input code and you can scale your player input based on the size of the mouse movement that's going into it. Now this will require a little bit of balancing to find a good trade-off with precision and quick turning. But even a simple linear modification of small input values and leaving large input values alone, such as the curve shown on the right here, will allow you to hit any pixel possibly, what's possible while still maintaining major, major movements. It's also mentioning at the moment that you can also scale the input for the very high end of movements, which will allow you to cap the rate at which players turn. This allows you to balance between players a little bit who have uh, higher mouse sensitivity. And it also has one benefit that it allows you to smooth the movement of the model when networked because you know the maximum speed it can move and you can interpolate between the two. Another feature we looked at with expectations is auto aim. Now auto aim is a contentious issue in games at the moment, especially if you're talking about highly competitive players. But unless your prototype is targeting competitive shooting as its hypothesis, auto aim can go a long way to provide a good shooting experience for a player, which raises your level of polish and brings you closer to what a finished game would feel. In some cases, we you can basically just get a away with removing it altogether. In this prototype that I'm showing right now here, we completely abandon the concept of aiming to focus on the competitive 
nature of slow tactical combat, choosing where you are on the map and what your abilities you would use. In this prototyping, the direct aiming was removed and replaced with a timed accuracy, which as a target would enter your field of view, your accuracy would come down to the point where you would get a perfect shot. This allowed the gameplay of the prototype to focus on your positioning, your use of cover, and more importantly, the blink ability, which allowed you to instantly teleport out of someone's aim. This made that the competitive advantage you edged out was not due to your aiming capabilities primarily, but more about your tactical decisions made. Now, in the past, most multiplayer prototyping could be done on a LAN, where lag is mostly non-existent. This allowed prototype to get away without polishing the network experience almost at all. However, Wargaming Sydney has always had to deal with the situation because a lot of the players and stakeholders we might be working with are halfway around the world. As you can see from this map, we could be playing with any one of these studios or supporting them in our prototypes. My last example though, that I'm showing in this section, does actually apply more to everyone at the moment in the current work from home scenario. More and more people are working with people who may not be co-located co with them and can benefit from the benefits of the network LAN. So in one prototype we built, the effective lag was especially noticeable in the laser weapons, even at small latencies, because on the player's client, they would resolve instantly and they would leave a lingering VFX that would confirm to their shooter that their shot hit on their screen. As you can see, the laser VFX here is very short, but this was still enough to skew feedback that people were more focused on the fact that they wouldn't deal damage on a hitting shot. Now, while it can't be used in a shipping game due to the risk of cheating, in a prototype, it's perfectly acceptable to allow a client to be authoritative over the damage they deal. And this can turn an unplayable experience into one that can still be effective. This reduces player disappointment and allows them to focus on more than just the shots that are missing. Now, the implementation will depend on your engine, but the principle is very straightforward. You disable the damage events on the server, and you allow the owning client to send a damage message to the server when it detects a hit. In this case, this allowed us to test and play this prototype against players who were situated in Europe with pings around 400, and the games were still competitive. I think the final series count was 2-1, and most games came down to one or two players being left alive at the end. Now, the next series of examples focuses on iteration and how you can make it faster for your users and what benefits you can reap out of that. In identifying the core aspect of one of our prototypes, we found that we wanted, we knew we wanted a diversity of volume of weapons uh, to be placed on units. And we knew that each of these units may need to support multiple weapons. As it was going to be a multiplayer combat game, we knew the effective networking was important and we knew the balance was also of high concern. So, we made the decision to invest in a single weapon system that could handle a large amount of flexibility, and it was very much key to the success of the prototype. Now, the weapon system itself was built on just a very flexible data-driven fire cycle that was shared between all the weapons. So no matter what weapon you had, it went through all the four cycles of ready, prepare, release, and recover. This allowed the firing cycle to be deterministic because all weapons um, would follow the same process, and the, the consequence of this was we could network it very cheaply because this determinism was guaranteed. Now the consistent data format and the consistent states of all the weapons allowed them to be grouped and swapped in seamlessly because you knew that every weapon would be fired through the same interface and it would basically provide up the same debug information or information for the UI. Now this consistency also allowed us to literally couple the input and the UI. Now, at the end of the day, what this gave us was a very flexible system that could create dozens of weapons and vehicles with very little effort. It meant that fixes could be made in all of them and they could all be shared debugging information to make it easier to understand what was going on. Now, there's no way for me to capture footage for this one because of the sheer number of weapons and units involved, but I'll just leave you with a quote from the designer. Um, the ability to put five different guns on a unit and it just worked was awesome. He got up to a lot of mischief, but at the end of the day, this was a great success for sh creating a good player experience that showcased a lot of different weapons and a lot of different units. Now, another thing to note is the investment in the system was well worth it for the original prototype. 
it was even more valuable because we could reuse it in later prototypes and it got further polished each time we used it. The lesson to take away from this though was that we should have avoided coupling the weapon system to particular prototypes because it made reuse harder and after the second prototype this code base was not clean, needs to be cleaned up before it can be reused again. Now, as part of innovation time, myself and several members of my team submitted an entry into the Unreal Mega Jam this year called Imprism. This is a chaotic and cooperative action game. We decided early on to keep the build content and gameplay on a grid to try and create some sense of structure to the chaos we were going to bring. This constraint allowed the team to invest in helpers for working with the grid and allowed us a lot of consistency in debugging and building features. Everything we built was based on the grid, from casting spells, pathfinding, decision making, the cages that would catch imps, the constantly expanding lava pits, they're all built on the same foundation. It was easy to understand, it was easy to work on, and the sheer amount of content we managed to generate in five days was impressive and purely based on this grid system. Now, atmosphere. Atmosphere can make or break a game experience. The lack of it will kill the vibe, and one of the most earliest and most loved hack-up projects I worked on was built around a running race. Now, without a vast number of players, it really felt a bit flat, because to be perfectly honest, you just ran from A to B. Now, enter a whole bunch of AI buddies, and all they did was run a predetermined path, and they looked a bit janky doing it. But the atmosphere of running through with this crowd of people through the course really sold the atmosphere of the game type. And I will add that it was a very little effort to do so. I couldn't actually find original footage of the prototype, so I mocked this up in just a few minutes. It was very quite straightforward, and it's pretty impressive how much more engaging and chaotic the race's atmosphere is with all these AI bodies running along beside you. Now, the last set of examples I want to talk to is about juice. Uh, one of my favorite talks from not so recent history is the Juice It or Loose It talk, which goes into a lot of detail to show all the small amounts of polish that can make a game come alive. All of these techniques are and, and very useful in prototyping because they allow you to draw attention to what's important. The main distinction that you need to make between prototyping and juicing a game presented by this talk is you don't want to polish everything in a prototype because you do want certain things to stand out. Now, I found early on in one of the Ludum Darius I did, I was getting bored testing the same old boring sub and movement. I had to do this Every few minutes, whenever I made a change, I would go through the same movement. In many ways, I was drawing attention to something that I needed to improve and polish. Basically, by adding a few bubbles to the rotor, a little rotor that spins, some bubble physics, and a little captured state, I really managed to bring the core loops functionality up to a good state of polish that made it enjoyable just to move around and shoot. And that was all it took to really get people to engage with the game and give them space and remove distractions that they were getting bored from the little story that was happening around it. <coughs> In a similar vein, making a feature novel so the player wants to engage with and feel good with it um, can imp just increase the rate of people use a feature. We saw this early on when people just wanted to drop into lava, that was probably a detriment. In this case, it was very effective for a ball movement we added into one of the prototypes. In here, just adding a little bounce to the enter and exit animation of the sprint mode really sold the movement, as well as um, <coughs> it helped hide the fact that there was no animation because there was no artist on this project. The second piece of polish that went into this was actually to remove the texture from the ball. The reason is the ball texture gave you focal points and it basically made it look like it was floating through the grass. By actually removing the texture combined with the grass going past and a nice motion blur, this gave the instance that the ball was rolling and not just moving sideways, which really sold the feature and got a lot more engagement with people using it. Now I finally reached the last example that I'd like to talk about and it's quite simple to show it off. 
if you have a complicated damage or shooting model system, I know of no better way than damage numbers to deliver a lot of nuanced information to the player. Now you may disagree with the practice in games because it can be aesthetically jarring and may not fit the mood, but that kind of problem is for shipped games. In World of Tanks here, you can see the damage numbers, they're small, they're discreet, they're well integrated to the UI and they highlight the game systems. I wouldn't recommend this for a prototype. The goal here is to get as much information to the player effectively so they can engage with your system. There is nothing wrong with putting up words if you think it will allow players to engage with your prototype in the intended fashion. Now, this might be a bit excessive, but you get the idea. Don't let them miss out on it. Which brings me to the end of the talk. I hope you've enjoyed learning about how and why you should polish a prototype. Remember, the most effective polish for a prototype is to prepare. So I'm going to leave you with a quote that I found when looking for a good prototype definition that made me smile. So if a picture is worth a thousand words, then a prototype is worth a thousand meetings. And I'm still trying to figure out if that is more meetings or less meetings. But thank you. Any questions?